a shout of praise. Hallelujah, Lord. Jesus, we love you, God, and we want to worship you, Lord, in spirit and in truth, Lord Jesus. Lord, we worship you, we serve you, God, in everything we do, Lord, with every breath, with every thought. Lord, every day, God, we just want to give you all of our praise. Hallelujah. What to say, Lord, it's you give me life and I can't explain just how much you mean to me now that you will save me, Lord. I give all that I am to you every day. I can be the life that shot your name. Okay. 
Jesus, because you've been so good to us, Lord. We love having fun with our Lord this morning. Oh, we love to worship you, oh Lord. Love to have fun in your presence, oh God. Just like little children we dance before your throne. Oh, we come before you, God. Lay down everything that stands in the way of you. Oh, yeah. And we're going to sing like the same. Thank you. 
freedom in your presence, Lord God. We love you, Jesus. Come on, lift your voices and worship him. Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah, Lord. Oh, we need your presence in this place, oh God. Oh, we need you, Lord. Come on, lift it up and worship him. Lift up a song of praise to our God. Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah, Lord. Lord God, Lord, it is our prayer this week, Lord, that we would not leave here the same way we were when we came in. Lord, we want to be branded by you, Lord God, that there would be something that we would never be able to shake off of us, God. Just like when, when Jacob was wrestling with God, he touched him and he was never the same, Lord. And that's our prayer this week, Lord Jesus, that you would touch us, God, that you would take our hearts and that you would brand us with your fire, Lord Jesus. Lord, that you would just take every bit of us, Lord God, and change it to your glory, Lord Jesus. Oh, Lord, I want to be branded by fire, God. Ooh. Hallelujah, Lord, Jesus. The cry of our hearts, oh God.
Jesus Oh no, let us never be the same Let us never be the same Oh, let us never be never be the same again Oh, let your glory fall Let your glory fall on me, Lord I'm touch the hem of your garments, Lord the hem of your garments, Lord. Jesus, would you just fall on us, Lord God? Lord, like a shower, Lord Jesus, in through this place. Lord, saturate our souls, God. Let your spirit be so strong in this place that wherever there's bondage, wherever there's chains, God, that they would just fall to the ground.
No matter the cost, God. No matter how I feel, Lord. I will obey you, Jesus. And I lay aside every way, every way. I lay it down, I lay it down, I lay it down. Lord, we know that you inhabit the praises of your people, Jesus. Lord, when we lift our voices in praise to you, God, you're in the midst of it, God, and we want you to show up in this place, Lord Jesus. So we just wanna lift, lift every breath, lift everything that's in us this morning, God, with all of our minds and with all of our strength, God. We wanna lift up a praise offering to you, God. Lord, as we lift it to the heavens, Lord, we know that you'll be there in our midst, Jesus. I know 
Let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise this morning. Yes, Lord, we give you praise. We give you glory, Lord. You deserve our praise, Jesus. You deserve all honor and glory and honor. Woo! Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. Come on, my. Yes, Lord, you may begin to make your way back to your seat this morning. <clears throat> I trust that you slept well last night. So that's the greatest joke so far, huh? Young people, I want to encourage you. I really want to encourage you when... Uh, when you have an opportunity to go back to the hotel and rest, that you take advantage of every bit of that time. <laughs> you know, you don't want to stay up all night long like some of my teenagers would want to do and play spades, you know what I'm saying? You do that, you're going to, miss, you're going to be so tired, you're going to miss out what God wants to do in your life this week. I want to come fresh and ready, amen? And all the youth leaders said... <laughs> <laughs> told my wife this morning, I said, I'm not as young as I used to be. <laughs> Praise the Lord. <clears throat> I'm looking forward to a great day today. We're in for a great treat. Uh, my good friend's going to be coming this morning. Then after uh, this afternoon, our Master's Commission uh, Director, Randall Graves, is going to be ministering here in the sanctuary. And uh, all of the leaders are invited to join me across the street in FLC, which is where you'll be having lunch at. Right after lunch, I'll be meeting with all the leaders uh, this afternoon at, at 1.30, I think it is. And then tonight, Michael Rowan will be here. So, hallelujah. But the neat thing is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords is here all day long. Hallelujah. Why don't you give a great big friend, my friend, a great big warm welcome this morning as she says wild and crazy applause. Come on. 
season. You're too amazing. Are they not the cutest? Everybody clap for my gang over here because you're just amazing. What fun. Okay. All right. Let's take a little survey. You know what? Pull the house lights up only for a little bit of sharing and then whoever's on the light stay there because I'm going to pull them back down. Pull house lights way up for a little bit. Can you do that just for a minute? Huh? Wake them up and then whoever's on the lights don't go away though and just yeah if I can still stay on the video you good job. Do you like my ponytail? I'll put it in a ponytail today. Don't you think it's kind of cute? Kind of cute ponytail. Kind of into ponytails today. Okay, all right. So so here's the deal. We want to we'll wake you up, and then we'll pull it back down. You can still see that, but you can't see those screens, but we'll pull it down in a minute because, you know, it's okay. All right. We, all right, let's take a quick survey. How many of you, yes, amen, you were asleep by 1 a.m.? Uh-huh. You were not only back in your room. You were asleep by 1 a.m. There was at least 15 of you. That's it. <laughs> How many of you, you were asleep by two? I want to understand what we're looking at here. Uh-huh. My team, because they had been to bed for 12 days. Yeah. <laughs> Josh and Meg's team, not mine. All right. And interns, what time did you guys go to bed? Never mind. Forget it. We'll let it pass. All right. So, Tian, you're fibbing. You left here and had a... But, you know, it's a hard cruise to intern with me. It's a hard life. I sent them here and get them a condo on the beach. So they can, it's a hard, hard, hardship. Everybody go, ooh, for my interns. So they just can feel, it's hard. Somebody's got to do it. All right. That's why they love that I'm so close to Brother Richard. Okay. They, you know, they're glad that I'm not really close to somebody in like Des Moines, Iowa or something. Because there's nothing much to go visit in Des Moines. Well, if you're from Des Moines, I'm sure it's a happening city. Okay. Uh, so... All right, and then, all right, how many of you, you it was 2 o'clock or after when you hit the sack? Can I see your hands? That was me. 3 o'clock, I rolled over. But I have an experience to share with you that will make your day. Uh-huh. Randall and Donnie and Billy and company, they were taking me home last night. And uh, see, uh, Randall is such a nice man. And isn't he wonderful? Teresa, where are you? Tree, I love you. I love you, Tree. I love you, Tree. Okay, we're all nuts about Tree. Her name's Teresa, but it, but they call her Tree, and that's not a slam. She's not, you know. Anyway, and so I, they, Randall was taking Donnie to take me home, and they are back to the hotel, and they said Crystal was still open. Now this is an event from last night. I love Crystal. If you, this is like my childhood flashback. I love it. So you know, you'll be happy to know that the Crystals do they stay open all night? I'll get a little commercial. 24, uh-huh, you were in the city of 24-hour crystals. And so we kind of were led of the Lord. We went through crystal again, and uh-huh, I got more crystals. Isn't that exciting? But that, the fun does not stop last night. Not only was crystal open, but ladies and gentlemen, those of you who live in this area, or you have one of these in your hometown, you are spoiled. You don't understand what you have. There are Krispy Kremes in this city. Yeah! Hosanna to the living King of Kings, Krispy Kremes. So, and there are, are they open all night too around here? Or just, I mean, Pensacola is a city kissed by the Holy Ghost. And, and so, so, you know, they were still open. And so Randall and Donnie said, you want to, you know, after you get the crystal, you want to go through Christmas. And then some of you, again, you don't understand. The light was on last night. That means they were making fresh Krispy Kremes. So I'm eating crystal in one hand and Krispy Kreme in the other and felt trashy when I woke up this morning from all the junk. But it was wonderful last night. So everybody, wild applause for Krispy Kreme and crystal if you like them. It was an event. It was, a, it was an event. Okay. So, you know, and some of you, how many of you, your city, I mean, no big deal. You have Krispy Kremes right near you. You know, we hate all of you. You know, we, <laughs> we anyway, said in love, but <laughs> you're spoiled brats. Okay. Hey, let me, let me just do something real fast and get the quick commercial. I'm not a good commercial giver, so let me get it out of the way. And let me first say real clearly Oh, well, let me get these handed. I think most everybody got these at the door. We handed them out to everybody, hoping that at least all the youth leaders and youth pastors would get them. If you're a youth leader, youth pastor, or somebody 
involved in youth ministry or would be interested in one day being involved in youth ministry and did not get the source sheet as you came in, raise your hand and we will go running to you. I think it's, uh, we okay? Well, look at what an amazing team. I think you guys got, all right, you guys scatter. Do you mind standing up if you don't have it? Because really in the lights, it is tough to see you. So do you mind standing up if you don't have a sheet just for a minute? You know, kind of, kind of just, do you mind doing that? Run, you guys, if you just, is there anybody in the balconies? I can't tell if there needs to be. Are you guys in the balconies? Or, yeah, there, we need people in the balconies with the handy dandy sheets. Okay, you are amazing. Just keep standing until somebody gets, then I need one of my team on that side also, please, because somebody's racing to the balcony. I think up here I heard him go, yay, yay. Look at him run. Next generation, Next generation is uh, the leadership uh, team of individuals from our place that's here visiting that's run by uh, Josh Mayo and Megan Balsitas and Ann Tamborello and they are here and they are now running all over being their usual amazing self. Uh, let me, uh, it's schedule's a little bit too tight and uh, so it, this I'm not able to, because uh, boy schedules get so full understandably to have time with the leaders so let me take about five minutes to talk about what really is an assignment on my heart from the Holy Spirit. And I want to make a quick, clear word to you. If you're, you're, you are a youth leader here and your finances are such that you're only going to be able to avail yourself of one person's resources, you should not listen to me. You should. Richard has a monthly tape club, which he will tell you about, I'm sure, in his leaders thing. Forget me and get his, because it's amazing. I get his tape. Thank you. I get resaved. Fortunately, aren't you glad that I get Richard's tape so I get saved every month? It's good. That's good. And so ignore me, get his, if you only have finances for one. But I will tell you that if I were in your position, I'd probably make... I mean, I would have given about anything to have had resources like both of these when I was in youth ministry, whether as a volunteer or Sunday school teacher or whatever. So let me, real fast, the passion of my heart is uh, twofold ministry-wise. First and foremost, it's the gang that's here with me um, because I'm determined uh, by the grace of Jesus Christ to be a to finish this thing out and be a wonderful youth pastor for as many years as the Lord makes me still be with it enough that I can relate to the youth culture. So my first ministry goal is obviously my own home front. And because uh, they don't give a rip if I speak places. Could they care? They don't care. They don't care. They just want to know if I'm for real and love them and can train some other leaders to do that. So that's, that's first ministry goal. You're looking at second ministry assignment. Uh, I will be 52 in a few days, and and through these wonderful years in youth ministry, I um, don't make fun of me for being 52. All right, so you what you were really saying was, my, you don't look that old. Well, isn't that what you're saying? I knew. I, I'm sure. No, you don't have to clap over that. All right. So after wonderful years in youth ministry, the assignment of my life has been um, to just want to pass on as a bit of an adopted big sis. Uh, mentorship to other youth leaders, whether they're in full-time ministry or whether they're volunteers. Some of the greatest youth leaders in the whole place are volunteers. And to some young college individuals and career individuals that have a heart to be in youth ministry and want to be trained. And, and so uh, years ago, there are very few people that I am honored to, um, to have regular contact with. Um, everybody, everybody talks about mentorship and they make up this invisible, unreal thing that, to be honest with you, nobody ever has. I never had anybody. I never in all my years of ministry had somebody that would pick up the telephone and call me occasionally once every six months even and say, who'd been on the mountain of God ministry-wise and would say, how you doing? You know, how are things going? Uh, you know, it is my honor for Richard and I to have that kind of relationship. and. And I can't tell you, and I want to just say this, not because it's the politically correct thing to do. Um, I want you to know that Richard Crisco is more like Jesus up close than he is on this platform. And you need to clap for that because there aren't a whole lot of people you can say that about. More like Jesus up close. More like Jesus up close. And so you know, it's just, I wish I had enough hours so that I could be a decent kind of long distance friend, pick up the phone a little bit more often to other folks. And we don't, it's not, we're great friends, but it's not like we talk a million times, but we know we're there for each other. And I'm a bit of a, a big sis and, uh, you know, that sort of thing. The, the source is my ability to do that for youth leaders across the nation. And so let me just real fast tell you, 
Uh, you're going to, the, there's two things that I make available on the mentoring thing, and you're probably going to want both of them if your budget, because they're $15 each, or you can get both of them for only $7 more each month. And so I would say to you, you probably need to find the extra seven bucks and get both of them. The source is CD-ROM, or you can get it in tape, I guess, but most everybody now is getting a CD-ROM, and it's audio and data. And it's a CD-ROM of a live message from our place. So Amazing Jordan will just say to me, okay, we're taping tonight. So, we're like, you know, it's not anything special. We just turn on and tape it. We put on CD-ROM so you can listen to it on CD-ROM. Then uh, you can download on your computer copies of the notes and the fill in the blanks. So you can just pull it right off the computer, shift it, change it, do anything you want with it. Then we put the skits and the dramas written by all of our team, including amazing people like Sean Johnson, who's seated over there, our resident genius. And, and then you hear our kids do it. And then it just bless you because our skits are, I mean, he writes amazing big dramas. But these are just the fun little skits during the time. And they're right on there. And we send you the script. So if you don't have anybody who does drama, it's a piece of cake. I mean, you can just use ours. I send you a section with leadership materials in it, small group discussion outlines, and bonus materials. And then my fun part of the source is I go back into the studio and then I do what I call mentoring moments, where after the service is over, I will do inserts into the service tape or the CD-ROM of the night and say, okay, you're about to hear me make the altar call. Youth leader, this is how I'm doing it. This is why I'm doing it this way. You, you just heard me use this story. Let me tell you, a source for good stories is. So it's just me coming back on kind of as a big sis mentoring. So all of that comes on the source CD-ROM. And so you want that. That's once a month. And then the other one, which I just started after my National Youth Leaders Conference, which I love, is called Up Close with Jeannie. And it's just, thanks, you're a doll. It's just monthly, it's, it's not a CD-ROM, it's just a tape. But I just sit in a little studio and I pray for a walk in that I just think I'm there with a cup of coffee in my hand. It's you and me in the office. And we're just talking about something that I know would be hugely beneficial to you. So the last three, we just finished a series uh, on strategic steps for growth in your youth ministry, talking about real practical stuff. And so it's my fun. I usually just try to pray that the Lord kind of drops a, a word of encouragement or, or whatever in my heart for you. So I just pray for you on that tape and kind of do a little big cis sort of stuff. But then the rest of it goes real practical. And it's just me talking to you. And I'm in the studio, and I, it's real cool. I just get, I, I get pumped every time I do it. And so it's on just practical ministry topics. So, again, each of them are $15 individually. And you can take it for a month. And if you don't like it, then you can cancel it. And then both of them together is $7 more. So I'd advise, if possible, go ahead and get both of them. The, we would like to highly suggest, if you would today, and you don't have to pay a penny, you can do it by the, the month if you want to or by the quarter. I think that's how we break it off. But in other words, you can cancel when you want to. I don't want you to get it if it doesn't do any good for you. But if you, we would suggest that you go ahead and do it by credit card because i just got to tell you that that makes it light years easier from our side of the fence. And so you can check one resource or both resources. Let me just tell you right now, youth leaders, it, check this. We're going to collect them in a minute. And we're going to go ahead and collect them in a minute. If you go ahead and sign up today, and then if you don't like it, even if you sign up for the quarterly and you don't like it, then call and cancel it. That's fine. We don't care. I don't want you to keep paying for something you don't want. Sign up today. It doesn't cost you anything to sign up today. And we'll, you know, take it off your credit card or bill you if you want it done uh, billing-wise. And then if you sign up today, then I'm going to dismiss the people who sign up right now a little early at the end to go pick up. I'll give you your, you can run over to the resource table. And just for people who sign up right now, you can pick up a free copy of the source of your choice or you can have an up close. So it's just my little way to say you're amazing. I love to bless people that are at conferences. So fill this little pup in right now and we're going to collect it in about five minutes. I used to, it, and I'm going to call Josh up for a minute. You got to know that you're watching me walk in new territory. Um, I, I have traveled for 25 years and with the exception of a quick word about the source, never even made any of my resources available. And, and somebody uh, on my team that I respect very much in the Lord, Dan Valentine, kind of came alongside and said, sis, this is, you're kind of not doing what the Lord would have you do. So this is like the first time apart from our national youth leaders that I even made anything available over that resource table. So Josh is going to come up, my most amazing son, real fast, tell you what is, and throw stuff in the audience. So everybody, wild applause, wild applause for my son. 
Hey, is it all right if we give away some free stuff really quick? Because, yeah, I'm in the giving mood. And you know what? Um, just like Jeannie said, we've got some great stuff for some youth pastors in this room. Because we know, really, as a youth leadership team, many times it seems like you're all alone in the trenches and you got to kind of figure out uh, just some pragmatics and how to do some things. We've got a clue on a lot of stuff, meaning we, we have a clue on a lot of stuff, all of us. And we like to share that information with each other, you to us and us to you. So we feel like this is kind of a really cool way for us to do that. So what we've got here really quick for a youth pastor in the room is um, we've got a thing called Youth Ministry Basics. This thing is incredible. I, uh, I feel at home. Thank you. All right, what we're going to do really quick, though, Youth Ministry Basics. It's an eight-part series for youth pastors that gives you the pragmatics of youth ministry. It's the eight cores of Prosper that ta that's taken us from about a youth group of about 35 to about 1,000 weekly. It's got supplemental materials. All right, we got to play a time at Lighter, guys. I love guitar. But here's the deal. Youth pastors, if you can get one thing, we've probably only got about 20 of these. They're on sale out like crazy. This usually doesn't last very long at all. So here's the deal. They're not be back at the table. Um, but it's, uh, we've got a CD-ROM in here. We've got eight different tapes with supplemental uh, material for each one. Subjects like cell groups, how to start cell groups, cross-training, uh, an easy way for jumpstart new believers, Project 4 and 18, an explosive growth strategy, um, ministry internship program, how to run an internship program, leadership, raising up an amazing leadership core, how to start a leadership core. Another one is visitors. Uh, First impressions and follow up, how to take care of your visitors. Another one is point guard, how to get not a leadership team, but students involved in everyday leadership, everyday leadership in your youth service. And round 44 is our huge discipleship process. It's, this gives you all the materials. You want this, you want this, you want this. So I need a youth leader who can run up here or give me a hand. I need somebody to give this away to. Who can I give this away to? Oh yeah, that's 60 bucks he just got off right there. All right, we've also got all those titles and singles for eight bucks. Again, with the material to the side, this stuff's incredible. Who can I give it to? This is cell groups or cross train. No, 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 I need somebody else. Come on. No, I can't give it from the same group. I'm sorry. Come on, come on. Oh, I'm sorry. Come on, wait, wait, wait here. There you go. All right, hey, do we have any kids in the room? All right, we got something for you guys. We got a couple different titles. Living your life on the cutting edge. How to live your relationship with Christ to the cutting edge. Is something cool. I'm chucking this, chucking it out there. All right, another thing we got is finding true fulfillment. Finding the fulfillment that God wants in your life. Right there. Next one we got is passionate pursuit. Really cool tape series, three tape. You want to pick it up? Right there. And then the Lordship Factor, a cool thing on the Lordship of Jesus Christ. All right, last thing, youth pastors, you want to check this out. Uh, it's called Lesson and Bottom Line Lessons for Leaders. It's some of the best messages Jeannie's ever preached on in about 30 years of ministry. There's three part series, you want to grab it? Right there, standing up. Lady in the back, yeah, come on up here. Go ahead and grab it, it's right on the side. And last thing, Jesus with skin on, it's a, it's a video on one of Jeannie's key messages. And they're saying, throw it over there. What? All right. What? Oh, balcony. Yeah, I guess we'll use you guys. Thank you. Hey, we love you guys. Grab some stuff at the booth. You guys are amazing. <laughs> You're amazing. Okay, you are amazing. What fun. You just watch me stretch and grow. Okay, what, what fun. Okay, stand up one more time just to make sure everybody's in a good mood. Up, 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 up. You're so good. Youth pastors, fill up, fill out your source thing so I can give you a free one to go with your first paid one. But you don't have to pay anything today on the source subscription. And if you get it and don't like it, then we'll cancel it. But we'll collect those in about five minutes. Somebody, balcony, I want to take care of you. I'm going to send a free source and then a free up close up to the balcony. Guys, run him up to the balcony. Okay, you're ready. He's running. Go to that side over there. because And then run, brother, or throw or do something. Okay, so we just... One free source and what a deal. Okay, you know what? 
it, oh, what in the world? Okay, it is a, oh, well, that kid's going to the hospital. How do we do? That's good. Well, it's all for the cause. Okay. All right. Now, look, before you sit down, here, before you sit down, be really loud and rowdy so everybody is wide awake near you. You know, be real loud. You're amazing. You're amazing. You're amazing. You know what? Our worship team, I didn't even tell you this. Come on back up for a minute and play if you're around here anywhere. Let's pray for a minute. Everybody knows you can't pray without music. And if she's gone, we'll pray with that music. Okay, here's the deal. I'm going to talk to you today about a title uh, that, wow, I can't remember the last time I gave this message. I call it Beloved Unbelievers. And I'm going to talk to you today about um, kind of what the Lord showed me on how to be effective with winning people in your immediate family to Jesus Christ, because many of us have moms, dads, brothers, sisters that are not Christians. And many of the principles that I'm going to talk about would apply in front of non-believing friends that you love very much. So again, we call it Beloved Unbelievers. And if I was going to have a subtitle for it, I would take it from the book of Exodus, chapter 12. And subtitle would be A Lamb for a House. But if you will for a minute, simply because every great youth conference has all sorts of different energy modes. And this one is not a twist and shout one. And I kind of questioned it this morning because I knew you'd been up late, but I'm going to trust that you're mature enough to be able uh, to do it. And so if you will, please, why don't we just uh, right now ask Jesus to make this morning a morning. Uh, it's a pretty huge deal. Uh, see, um, when I came to faith in Christ, no one in my family was a Christian. I had referred to the fact last night I was an only child because of an RH factor problem that my mom had that before the shots came out and it was difficult for RH babies to live to term. And um, so, you know, my, my, I certainly didn't have the storybook life growing up. We'll just put it that way. I was raised in a real poor section of town. Yet in my house today, I have a sweet little picture of, of our little house that I lived in all my life, tiny, but it was my home. Um, my mom and dad, neither one of them were Christians. They eventually gave their lives to the Lord, but it was a pretty bumpy road. My mom was always loving and kind and just a great mom. My dad, uh, we just had a lot of bumps. We'll just put it that way. And um, I came to faith in Christ, and I remember thinking when not long after I got saved, thinking, you know what, it won't be long, and um, we'll, we'll be Christians. Well, you know, my mom and dad are surely give their lives to Christ. And you know, I'd hear great messages, just pray and believe, and all those were true, but I kind of just thought, you know what's gonna happen this year or something. And I gotta tell you that I got saved as a junior in high school, uh, and it was not until I'd come all the way through high school and all the way through college and was about to marry my husband uh, and move away. And I think it was a sweet love gift from Jesus that I could leave, leave home um, and move uh, many, many miles away. I'd gone to college away, obviously, but then I'd come home this summers. And the Lord was going to let them come to faith in Christ um, before I began to spend my life doing what I'm doing now. Uh, but I got to tell you, it was a bumpy road, and it wasn't near as fast as what I thought. And I made a bunch of mistakes there in front of my family. Uh, oftentimes, I preached louder than I lived. And so out of it, this message from Exodus 12 began to emerge. I want to see the hands, and this would be most of us, uh, who have at least someone in your family who means a great deal to you, or maybe they should mean a great deal to you, maybe they don't. Somebody in your family uh, who is not a believer. They may go to church, and you're not trying to judge them. But if they if they suddenly, you know, were in a car wreck or something, if you... If you didn't have a chance to talk to him again, you'd have some pretty huge haunting questions about where they'd spend eternity. And my hand's up on that, too, obviously. It's just some people that matter to you. Okay, that's obviously most of us. And then, um, obviously, for those of us that have uh, beloved non-believers as friends, and I wanna, I'm want to, i going to balance something out for a minute. And I, and I want to say this now as a, a youth leader to every one of you here. 
uh, after wonderful years in youth ministry, if you said, what's the one thing that you have most seen most consistently take youth and young adults who love God out? What's the big thing that's taken them out? The biggest factor that's taken them out of the game, with no question, it has been hanging on to relationships with non-believing friends. With no, that nothing else even comes close to competing with that. So I want to say to some of you that made choices last night and others of you that are trying to leave this conference at a whole new level spiritually, I often say to my gang at home, and they're going to say it with me because they know the line that's about to come. All right, ladies and gentlemen, let's do it. Show me your friends, and I'll show you your future. Do you know why they know that so well? I didn't get them alone today and say, let's practice this. you got to act like you know it. I mean, they probably think that that's going to be on my tombstone. And I just challenge all of you, don't ever make fun of the line, because that very line needs to be used to the Holy Spirit to haunt people at key moments. So don't ever even kid about it. I say it a million times because I want it to be haunting in people's heads. Show me your friends and I'll show you your future. In the name of, I want to get my friend, my best friend saved, oftentimes degrees and emphasis of relationship, friendship-wise are sustained. And let me explain to you, like, just for a minute, uh, bring me a chair real fast, real fast. And then, Donnie, come help me for a minute, will you? Okay. Can you stand on this? Will somebody get mad if you stand on that? Here, just stand on it, and we won't ever tell. Okay. I, I, please don't ever tell. Okay. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> Whoever's not. Okay. You, my gangs, again, these are just classic things that we do to visualize. You know, a bunch of you have non-believing friends that you've been real close to, and I don't mean you have to write them off, but the Word of God says light has no heart-to-heart -heart fellowship with darkness. And so the reality is lots of times in the name of I'm going to get my unbelieving friends saved, we go back into the same environments, the same level of hour-for-hour hour contact with them. And let me explain to you, hear it from one who's watched it countless times. You don't get them saved, they pull you back down. So I appreciate your desire to get your unsaved friends right after you come to faith in Christ, but you better limit your contact with them. And you'd better make it real clear. And you, you say, well, my friends say, boy, after I got saved, I spaced them. That, you know, that I feel like, how can I ever win them if I spaced them? That line is as old as Satan is. I mean, the devil needs to think of a new one on you. Yeah, you know what? You are going to have to back away from them if you spent close time because you're going to find yourself going back down. Because here's the bottom line. All right, okay, if Donnie, pull me up, will you? Come on, Don, Donnie, I'm just a little girl, for, but don't break my arm. Okay, all right. <laughs> See, real tough to pull down, but not real tough for me to pull him down. Thanks, Donnie. You're amazing. Everybody clap wildly for Donnie, who did such a good job standing on that chair. And so, in truth, you know what? It, we say, I'm going to get back in, home, and I'm going to still hang out with the same friends, but I'm going to pull them up. Well, you know what? Donnie tried to pull me up. That's real tough. But it was real easy for him, for me to pull him, pardon me, back down. And so, as I, as I balance this message, so it goes mostly to a context of family units. And that, you know, <laughs> trust me, you're fine there. Go for it. And you go, I just can't hang out with my dad. I'm afraid he's going to bring me down spiritually. Think not, all right? No. <laughs> no, Mom, I can't do the dishes for you today because I'm afraid it'll be a negative influence. No. No. <laughs> not happening there. <laughs> not happening. I'm talking friendships, okay? And so if... If, though, as I share, I want to make sure that this message sends you back to non-safe friends to be used of Jesus, but I don't want you to use it to rationalize something that will eventually pull you down. Do you hear me? And so, if you will, um, let's just pray. Baby, just sing anything. Isn't she a wonderful worship leader? She's so good. You know, she's so amazing. She's Richard's worship leader. And she's amazing. All right, let's just for a minute... Ask the Holy Spirit to, on this whole topic of beloved unbeliever, make it uh, something that changes how we live when we go home with people that we care deeply about. Will you? Let's pray. Come on. Father, in Jesus' name. Jesus' name. God, in Jesus' name. We honor. Father, it's a great morning, and you're beginning an amazing conference, and we thank you for 
huge fruit that you and you alone brought forth from last night. But Lord, as I do this, this my final general session with these amazing, wonderful human beings, I just ask Holy Spirit to find us all, whether we're up in the balcony or the back or the front, and wake us up because of, of the importance that this message will have way into our future. Lord, even now, Lord, we all think of some beloved unbelievers that matter in our life, and we just say, Jesus, help us to hear some things in the next few minutes that change how we approach this thing when we go home. Help us, Lord, even with our non-safe friends to do it sensitively, uh, to do it in no fashion that will violate any scriptural guidance. Uh, but Lord, we just agree together for the beloved unbelievers, particularly those in our family, that the next few minutes will be full of life in God. In Jesus' wonderful name, we pray it, Lord. Amen. Now, listen to me. Before you sit down, here's the deal. Wait a minute, don't sit down yet. Don't sit down. Youth pastors, you sit down and our youth leaders and fill in your little sheet so you can get your free thing to go with your first paid one. We're going to collect them down the aisle in about three minutes. And then you can go over right afterwards and get your freebie. So we're going to fill it in real fast. And do credit card if you don't mind because it's easier for me. So you sit down and do youth leaders, do that. The rest of you turn around, and here's the deal. Turn around. And, and you're supposed to look at like three different people and tell them three things they could do when they go home to be impressive to a non-believing family member, like make your bed, clean your room, fill the gas tank up, do the dishes. For crying out loud, do the dishes. Youth leaders, fill in that little sheet, and in about three minutes, I'll stop the message and have my next-gen kids pick it up. Youth leaders, just fill in your little sheets right now, and then, then I'll dismiss you at the very end to go over to the chapel and pick up either your free real fast and then your rendezvous with your kids for lunch. Free, um, you can choose what you want, if you want a free source or if you want a free up close, and we'll let you collect that. We'll trust your word. If you're a liar, you need more than the source to get you through. Okay, let's go and we'll collect those in a minute, but let me give you a minute. Fill it out. So, beloved unbelievers, a lamb for a house. Let me read to you Exodus 12. If you're taking notes, and I hope you are, from verses 1 through 8 and 11 through 13. And again, let me just encourage you. Uh, don't don't go to church without taking notes because it's it's you know, real important that you be a note taker wherever you go. Genesis chapter 12, and I'm going to read out of the King James again. I've both evenings, isn't that fun? I've read out of King James, which is not my, hey, have you found the Message Bible yet? It's really good. It's really good. The only problem with the message is they don't go verse by verse, and that drives me crazy, but it's worth the drive me crazy. But the message, this particular message, I use the King James also, and so I'm going to read to you. Exodus chapter 12, and it's talking about the Passover. Now let me, real fast, so you can get an idea of the Passover. Children of Israel were called of God to leave. Okay, we're going to have fill in the blank. Children of Israel were trying to come out of what land? You're supposed to be saying Egypt. Act like you know. The children of Israel were trying to come out of? Egypt. You're amazing. And they were trying to go to the? promised land. Oh, you were junior Bible quiz stars. Okay. And so then, you know, the Pharaoh and the enemy sent these plagues on the land as they were going out. And the 10th plague, and you may not know, but it would be the one you think of. It was kind of the big nasty one. The 10th plague was that the death angel was going to fly over the houses. And what was going to happen? Okay, the four, first bun, born, first bun, the first bun of every born. All right, 
the firstborn son. Oh, that sounded bad. I didn't mean that that way. All right. I just heard myself talk. Okay. You guys, can you see me through that pole? That's driving me crazy. All right. Who's behind the pole? Who is, is that the Sean behind the pole? Sean, you okay? All right. All right. Hi, Sean. Good morning. Uh, the, so if you're happy there, I'm happy. The, the firstborn son uh, was going to be slain as the death angel came over the house. It was part of the plagues that, that Pharaoh and the Egyptians and had been loosed on the children of Israel because they were trying to flee from Egypt. And so in the 10th plague that was going to happen, uh, God Jehovah spoke to Moses and said, tell my people that they don't have to lose their firstborn son. That all they have to do is, and it was the beginning of what was called Passover, and it's now yet to this day a wonderful spiritual tradition that is celebrated by Jews and all across the world. Passover was the night when they were to take a lamb from their house, and their, a lamb without blemish, to kill it as a sacrificial lamb, and to apply the blood of that lamb to the front doorpost, or in other words, the door of their house, and he said that then when the death angel flew over, then the promise of Jehovah was that the death angel would see the, the, the blood of the sacrificial lamb and would pass over their house. Thus, their firstborn son would not need to die. And that's where you get the term Passover, you know. And obviously, it was symbolic. And I love talking. See, if you don't have a bunch of new Christians in your youth ministry, you're missing the greatest thrill. See, I love the fact that even in our Next Generation team, we got a couple of relatively new Christians uh, that we just, it, it's a leadership team, but we, we grabbed a couple of amazing people like Jacob and Bryce and said, come on, do this thing with us, who just have recently come to faith in Jesus Christ. Bryce, a few months ago, and Jacob just gave his life to the Lord at Coram Deo. Just, I mean, he's not even two weeks old in the Lord. And, he, and both of them have a ton of leadership. So we, we said, come on and come on board with us. I love the fact that I get to tell them, okay, and I, I won't even ask them because I don't want to embarrass them. But I, you know what? I love the fact that they probably didn't even know what Passover is. And I, and I want to say to you, some of you, you have, you have a wonderful youth ministry, but you know what? If you had just tried to get some non-believers in your youth ministry, you'd have a whole lot more fun. You can clap over that. You'd have a whole lot more fun, you know, because you're not meant to be a little spiritual fraternity or sorority snob group. But anyway, then others of you, though, non-believers come, but they don't get saved because you aren't different enough from everybody else on the outside world for them to think they need to get saved. That's another issue. You're also supposed to not be just a place where people hit on people of the opposite sex. But moving right along. <laughs> moving right along. All right. So all that is to say we have some new believers even in the leadership team that we've got here. And, and see, it's fun because I get to say, okay, Bryce and Jacob, come here. Come here real fast. All right. Ever Bryce and Jacob, come on up here. Come on. Come on. Come on, here we go. Let's have everybody clap for Bryce and Jacob. Everybody clap. Okay, here we, all right, we're gonna do, all right, okay, this is this moment. Tell me that, why, he says, why, why, why? Look, aren't they sweethearts? Okay, all right, all right, aw, uh, uh, okay, all right. So here, we're gonna have this family moment. Come here, come up here. Come on, boys, come on, Bryce, act like you know me. All right, we're gonna have this family moment, and we're not, we aren't in front of people, okay? Okay, got it? All right. Okay, now, if you both knew this story all before, then I'm real bad. So I hope you're kind of halfway not knowing it before. Okay, we're by ourselves alone. Okay, now, you know, Passover. Is this kind of a new thing for you, this Passover thing? Yeah. 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 yeah I've no. heard it a little, but. Yeah, you know. That's good. That's good. That was a good line, Bryce. Okay, so, you know, how you want? Rugrats Passover on Nickelodeon, I saw okay. it. <laughs> See? See, Rugrats, Nickelodeon. You're the man, baby. That was very good. Okay, so now we, we got it. Okay, so so now, Passover, now, did you kind of hear me explain it? Did we kind of hear me explain it? You know, Death Angel. Okay, all right, see, Death Angel is going to come, and then, yeah, yeah, so kind of do the, do the recap of it. Can you try it? Between the two of you, you can share. Here, take the microphone. All right, I'll help you. And you start, and then you push it in his mouth. All right, like, there, go. Um, they put blood on the door, so the thing would pass him over and they wouldn't die. That's right. It's right. She's That's gonna right. take it from me. That's right. And, and some of the oldest son not being taken. That's right. Oh, you 
are good. All right, now come here, you two. All right, now here's the deal. The reason the lamb was chosen, this is kind of a tricky thing. In Bible typology, you know, that's like, like symbolism in the Bible. Jesus is, Jesus hasn't come yet, and he's going to come, and he's the Messiah. We got that, like the big guy that's going to die for our sins. We got that one? Yeah. You know, he's why you're going to heaven and not hell. It's a good thing. And so, so here's the deal. He's, he was called in the Old Testament, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Clever, huh? So see, here's the deal. It's like God's given us a picture that's kind of foreshadowing Jesus come, coming later who will be sacrificed just like this little lamb is on a cross and his blood will be shed for the forgiveness of our sins. Tricky, huh? Tricky, isn't that good? Just warms your heart today, doesn't it, Jacob? Jacob, just share with people. Doesn't it just warm your heart? Yeah, very much. Okay, all right, Jacob. All right, all right. now 20 seconds, and you guys don't have to go long. It's too early to be profound, but they're my friends. So, okay, 20 seconds, for real. Tell these people, just real briefly, uh, tell them how the Lord's changed your life. And I know it's too early and all that stuff, and it doesn't have to be anything long. And, and yeah, Bryce is over here saying to Jacob, and you've got first. That's mean. But anyway, just 20 seconds, just, just give a little testimony. It doesn't have to be long. So that if they don't have some friends that they're trying to win to Jesus, you know, they can at least be motivated. Um, God kind of turned me away from drugs and alcohol and addictions. And uh, actually, um, to this, like, today and, like, in the past couple of days, I've been, like, totally not even needing to think about the drugs or anything at all. So. Um, Jesus has just filled my heart with so many different feelings and feelings of passion and joy that I can't even explain in 20 seconds. And it's not my life was really bad beforehand, it's just, it was empty. And the way I believe is that anyone's empty unless they have Jesus Christ in their life. And it was just empty. And now my heart's just filled with so many things I, I can't even explain. And I'm just blessed in an awesome way because I have Jesus as my Savior and Lord. Okay. So just remember your first preaching moment was in Brownsville. That's pretty impressive. All right. <clears throat> hey, uh, next gen, why don't you circle in some of you the balcony too. Collect, pass over the source sheets to the end of the aisle. Go to the ends of the aisle real fast, including balconies. And some of you go to both sides of the balcony. Then bring them back to Josh up here. Pass the source sheets. And then it, I'll dismiss you guys early so you can pick up your freebie. Okay, while they're doing that, don't talk, <laughs> all right? Let me read Exodus 12, now that I've described it to you, but it was King James. I just, Exodus 12, verses 1 through 8 and 11 through 13 reads like this. And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be unto you the beginning of the months. It will be the first month of the year to you. Speak you unto all the congregation of Israel, saying in the, on the tenth day of the month, they will take to them every man a lamb. Everybody say that. Every man a lamb. According to the house. Say according to the house. Of their fathers. And then this is where I get the subtitle. A lamb for a house. Everybody say a lamb for a house. For a house. And if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next unto his house take it according to the number <coughs> excuse me, according to the number of souls. So you see the lamb was very connected, the sacrifice of the lamb to the souls and the lives of the people inside. Every man according to his eating shall make his own count for the lamb. And then it says in verse five of Exodus 12, your lamb shall be without blemish. Everybody say without blemish. Then say, ooh, ooh. that's the bad part. Yeah, okay. I'll make sense out of it. A male of the first year, and he shall take it from the sheep and from the goats. And then it goes on down to verse 7. It says, And then you shall take the blood of the lamb that you have sacrificed, and will strike it on the two side posts and on the upper door posts of the house wherein you will eat it. And then it goes on down. Um, so you're supposed to kill the lamb, the one lamb without blemish, put the blood on the doorpost, verse 11, 12, and thus shall you eat it with your loins girded and your shoes and your feet and your staff and your hands, and you will eat it quickly, for it is the Lord's Passover. 
for I will pass through the land of Egypt this night, the death angel, and will smite all of the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both men and beasts, and against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment, for I am the Lord. And verse 13 says, And the blood shall be unto you as a token upon the houses where you are. Say, upon the houses where you are. Okay, so the blood was supposed to be as the Lord, the Lord sent the death angel, a token, a symbol, a covenant between them where the houses where they were. And then I love you. This is an old song. Only people like Richard and me and a few of the youth leaders would remember it. And when I see the blood, it says in verse 13, I will pass over you. That is a great song. You know, old, my throat's so shot from the years. I have so I can't even sing anymore. I used to be able to. But when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And in the old timey, uh, you know, Assemblies of God churches, we used to sing that song. And then it, it goes on uh, in the, verse 13, and it says, And the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. And so I, today I want to touch uh, for me what the Holy Spirit's learning curve was on breaking down in Exodus 12. And he makes it pretty easy for you because he gave me just simple alliteration, three words that start with P that kind of break it down if you want a beloved unbeliever, especially in your family, to come to faith in Christ. The first one on your notes that you're writing down is the provision. Everybody say it real loudly so you get it. The provision. And again, if you haven't written on your notes, Exodus 12, verses 1 through 13. And the provision comes from Exodus 12, the second part of verse 3. So you can put 3B there if you want to. Because it says this, take to every man a lamb for his family, a lamb for an house. Take to every man a lamb for his family, a lamb for his house. And so I've already described, I've already described the, the, the whole look of, of Passover, that a family had to choose a lamb, and that then they were to sacrifice the lamb, put the blood on the doorpost, and when the death angel came over, everybody inside the house was going to be was going to be saved. But early on in my walk with Jesus Christ, I so desperately wanted my folks to come to the Lord. They were a million miles from Him. Matter of fact, my dad was probably um, not probably. My dad was the hardest one to win because my dad came from a background of real religiosity. And uh, my dad was raised in a family with 12 kids, and, and the only person saved in the family was his mom. Well, that was remarkable, and I'm ever so grateful, and I'm sure that she prayed for me and all that sort of stuff. But my, my grandmother was real legalistic, and she had a lot of rules. And like, like, I can remember one day after I was living for the Lord, I cut my hair. And to my grandmother at that point, that meant I was no longer a Christian. And my grandmother had some theology that I would disagree with that said, you know, unless I had my prayer language, I was not going to go to heaven. And you know what, folks, as I read the Bible, your prayer language is amazing, marvelous. I commend the blessed Holy Spirit to all of you in the fullness of Acts 2. But I want to give you great news. I don't, as I read the Bible, think that that's what gets you to heaven. What you got to, so, you know, in the church, we don't have to all wrestle over that. The bottom line is we better make sure that people understand that Jesus is Lord. And that's what gets you to heaven. And you can clap for that just so everybody knows we're on the same corner of the block there. My grandma was a little different, you know. She wouldn't ever cut her hair, but she kind of she, somehow it was okay. And her, but when she wanted to, to make her bangs shorter, she would take a, she would take a, um, a match and she would singe her bangs because that wasn't cutting them, but that was sitting out. I mean, <laughs> grandmother, your hair's on fire. I mean, <laughs> I mean that's a nerve-wracking thing, but. So nobody in my dad's family was saved except for her because unfortunately the lady meant well, but she just didn't present Jesus Christ in a positive way. It was real legalistic and negative. So when I gave my life to the Lord, my dad went freako because, you know, he said, great, now I've got some sort of freak in my family and all that sort of stuff. And so I will tell you that neither one of my folks were real op open to the gospel. And like I said earlier, I just thought, you know, if I just share for a little while, then pretty soon they'd come to faith in Christ and we'd be one little happy family and I'd be up giving my testimony. And the weeks went to months and the months went to years. Early on, I, I tried, I found this scripture, a lamb for a house. And I understood the symbolism in the Word of God, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, Jesus Christ. And as I understood in Exodus, 
I, I grabbed a hold of that and I said, Lord, I want to be an extension of you to my family. I want to be a lamb for the Suttoth house. That was my maiden name. I want to I want to be a lamb for a house in my family and so I said by faith Lord uh, you let me be the person who says you know what hell's not gonna have my family all right now some of you need to get that into your gut right now because if you don't get in your gut why don't you ask me who is gonna stand in faith for your family see if you don't if you don't care why don't you just figure out who's gonna and you go well you know what my family have been rotten to me so what so what you know, and, and I understand family being rotten. There was a huge, there were mountains of pain between my father and myself. But the issue is that I still knew that somebody needed to stand in faith for my family so that they could spend an eternity in heaven. And so I would pray and say, Lord, this scripture from Exodus, the very first one, and on the first P, the provision, I would say, Lord, you say in Exodus 12, verse 3, Take every man a lamb for his family, a lamb for a house. I want to be that. You are the ultimate provision. But, Lord, I, I want you to help me, in Jesus' name, to be uh, that kind of amazing, amazing sort of extension of yourself to my family. And, and so it was that, you know, the Lord was, was amazing, and I began to witness to my parents, and, you know, I was going to be the provision. I was going to be, yes, we're all going to get saved. And I quickly learned that my parents were not impressed with my new Bible language, nor were they impressed with the number of times I went to church. Matter of fact, they were freaked by the number of times I went to church. How many of you have people in your family that after you got saved, they weren't real sure they were happy this had happened, you know? See, my, my family was okay. My parents understood. They were fine with me going to parties and doing all those sorts of things because that was their world. They were non-believers. They loved me, but they were okay with the party scene because that had been their world. They just didn't know how to handle it when suddenly I wanted to go to church all the time. And they thought it was a cult and all that sort of thing. And so, you know, I, I would try to preach to them. I'd come home and give them the old heave-ho, you know, like, like delicate ways, like you're going to burn in hell and stuff. I was real subtle, but I wasn't quite that bad. No, I didn't say quite that bad, but almost. And my, my dad especially, he was just, my dad had a line that those of you who have unsafe parents, you probably hear it. And I just want to bless you so you can just know I heard it years ago. Satan uses it to discourage people even years ago. Whenever I would do the least thing wrong in the house, my dad would say to me, and Jeannie Lynn, I thought you were a... Yeah, you know the line. How many of you have heard that from somebody before? You know, some implication of that, you know? And granted, if we're living a hypocritical lifestyle, they, they need to be able to throw lines like that back at you. But it was his own guilt, and I understood uh, years later what was fashioning. And he, matter of fact, he would throw it back at me so many times that I almost wanted to keep my Christianity incognito so it wasn't thrown back in my face sometimes in my family. But I said, Lord, I want to be a lamb for a household in the Sadath family. I want to be an extension of yourself. And so, you know, I tried to do all these, these neat, you know, invite them to church and stuff. They weren't interested in going to church. And I took them to my little church. My little church freaked them out. And, you know, so then they were real sure that I was in a cult, you know. And so, you know, and I just want to say to all of you, and some of you are youth leaders, you'll hear me reference and kind of tell you how I train if you pick out some of the youth leadership materials, you know, that are available. Folks, it, you know what, don't we all wish we could live in Brownsville? Don't we wish that we were all kissed by the Holy Spirit, now listen to me, to live in what really, I gotta tell you, some of you turn your nose up, uh, this, this revival has been going on how many years, Richard? Six years, and I know you would have no way of knowing, but give me a wild guess as to how many people have come to faith in Christ. Hundreds of thousands. So don't tell me you got a revival at your place if a bunch of people are shaken and falling over and a couple of people are getting saved. Do you hear me? Biblical revival is that which brings the church back to holiness and has with it a huge outpouring of the non-believers getting saved. So a bunch of you, you know, you, anyway, all right. Bless you, bless you. Okay, that's for another day. So is the shaking and all that real? Sure it is. You know, are there some people that are not valid? In every church there are. But the bottom line is what is happening here is tremendously valid. And, and so I took my family to a church, at my little church, and it was a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful little church, but they saw some things they didn't understand, and, you know, I didn't have any decent answers for them and kind of freaked them out. And so 
Uh, and there's nothing wrong with having great questions, but I just, you know, got all defensive. And then I began to realize that my dad didn't care so much about how many times I went to church or my mom. That didn't impress them. What impressed them was if I, if I had a better attitude in the house. You hear me? What impressed them was if I volunteered to wash the dishes when I didn't have to. What impressed them was when I borrowed the car if I brought it back with a full tank of gas. What impressed them was if I treated other people differently and shared and was more unselfish. See, those are the things that were most going to speak to my parents. And so in that first stage of being a lamb for the, the son of house, the provision stage, I started out preaching. And, and again, there's nothing wrong with preaching. Uh, but you know what? My life needed to preach way more than my words. And I quickly just shut my mouth and felt kind of prompted of the Lord to just live it authentically, to become the kind of person who did apologizing fast. That's real Christianity. Do you hear me? You want to show it to your family and people that matter to you, to beloved unbelievers, learn how to apologize real fast. That'll make them think Jesus has changed your life. Change your attitude. Be more unselfish. They'll, they'll get real impressed real fast. I often think of the story of the little girl who was looking at her daddy, and she'd gone to church, and she was only about six or seven with her family for years, and her family's a Christian home. And so finally the little girl was deciding if she wanted to be a Christian too. And, and so she was at the end of the service. She looked up at her daddy, and she said, Daddy, I think maybe I want to be a Christian too. Would you describe to me what a Christian's like? And her daddy looked down, you know, this tender moment. He said, well, honey, a Christian is a person who's like Jesus, you know, who loves and is unselfish and caring and forgiving and serves other people. That's a person like Jesus. That's what a Christian is. And the little girl looked up at her daddy and said, quite honestly, Daddy, have I ever seen a Christian? And I think that's what a lot of our families think, you know? That's great, you know, that you can preach it, but they would rather see a sermon than hear one any day. And so in the provision stage, I quickly learned that I better shut my mouth and prioritize my actions. The second P taken from Exodus 12 is the problem. And it's taken from Exodus 12, verse 5, the first part of it. I read it. It said, not only was there to be a lamb for the family, a lamb for the house, but secondly, your lamb shall be without, do you remember that word in the King James? Yell it at me. Blemish. You said it right. And that's, you can write that down, Exodus 12, 5. Your lamb shall be without blemish. Say that with me as you write it. Your lamb shall be without blemish blemish. Now, now kind of yell at me, mass yell, different words. They aren't going to all match. Give me other words for blemish. It doesn't mean a pimple. You know, sin, problems, difficulties. <laughs> I can just see some of you going, blemish. Lamb had acne. No, the lamb <laughs> was supposed to not have sin or any things that made it less than, than a perfect, a perfect lamb. And so, um, that was a problem because I was all ready to be a lamb for a house, but I wasn't real ready to be uh, a lamb that was working on not being perfect because nobody's perfect, but I wasn't real ready to be, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have my life changed and I'm going to try to be a great example of Jesus to them. And so I entered what I call, and you might want to write it on your notes, I call it the Holy Spirit School of R.A. and S.R., the Holy Spirit School of R.A. and S.R., and that stands for the Holy School, Spirit School of Rotten Attitudes and Stinking Responses. And I had a bunch of them, you know, rotten attitudes and stinking responses. Now, let me tell you that the most difficult people to be a Christian in front of will be your family. Do you know that? Can we hear that loudly? How many of you will relate that it, and this doesn't make you phony, that many times it is easier to be more godly and to work on your responses outside your home than with the people you live with? My hand is up. My hand is up. Okay. And that is because it is precisely the people that are most up close to you that you most easily take for granted. They're the safest people. So, so again, I've often said it is one of my big goals in life to have those who know me best love me most. 
And, and so I want my, like my amazing son that was up here a few minutes ago, I want, want my two sons and my husband to say, uh, and the interns and the youth staff, the people that are with me closest, to say, you know what, behind closed doors, she's everything she appears to be on a platform and more. Now, am I perfect? Nobody is. But as best I can, I try to leave, uh, live a life of, of integrity. But the real truth is that behind closed doors, my family yet to this day sees stinking attitudes that none of you would see. Now, I know the rest of you are perfect, and when you get home, you are just sugar boogers, you little sweethearts. Look at your neighbor and say, you're such a sugar booger. You're such a sugar booger. You are. You are a sweet patootie. But I was not always a sugar booger. <laughs> <coughs> And so, so I, I often would find myself at this problem stage. I'd find myself having rotten attitudes and wrong responses and voice tones that were wrong. Let me tell you what, if the Lord hasn't started dealing with you about your voice tones, he needs to. Hey, Scott Zabel, your mom called. I'm supposed to give you 75 bucks. Where are you? She's worried that you don't have money. I'm supposed to give you, yes, I'm supposed to give you, before you leave, remind me, I've got to write you a check for 75 bucks. Your mom's amazing. She also said you were supposed to call her as soon as you got here. Call home. Thank you. Real quick. All right. Yeah. Okay. All right. Moving right along. That was not an ooh. How many of you have called home? All right. Don't ooh him. All right. Thank you. All 10 of you have called home. All right. But your mom wants you to have money. Okay. But so often, you know, in this whole, this whole uh, problem stage, we, we find it easier to be spiritual with everybody else, but the people inside the house, man, they're hard. And the truth is that many of us want our parents and our brothers and sisters and people up close in the family to deeply respect the moves that we made in Jesus. And the sad truth is that many times when they give us negative response back, though we don't let them know that what's happening, we're deeply hurt on the inside. And that's where some of the anger and some of the other stuff comes. Please understand that the reason oftentimes family members don't respond right to you is just because they many times are confused, they're afraid, a little bit under the squeeze of the Holy Spirit, or maybe it's just that you are much more spiritual outside of your house than you are in. I over and over again have to look at my own family because again, I want to tell you, I want to tell you I'm perfect in my house. I am not perfect in my house. When I walk in my house, and I think a family does this for each other. You know what? When you get in your house and you shut the door, it doesn't give you a right to be carnal or to be sinful. But I'll tell you what, real family is take off the shoes and you don't have to comb your hair and you don't have to always be throwing kisses all around the room. Now, I mean, that'd be real sad if it was always, mmm, you little dirt. Now, come on, think of it. If I looked at my sons all the time, oh, Josh, oh, you're amazing. You're I about to say that all the time. But anyway, the issue is that when I've had a crummy day and I walk in the house, I'm okay. You know, I'm not going to go, oh, I'm wonderful, you know? How are you as a greeting, not a question. So I, I oftentimes, yeah, so you were slow, but I knew you'd get it if I left you there for a while. So sometimes in, in the problem stage, um, those that most need to see the character of Christ do not in us. And that is normal, but it is wrong. Can I say that again? That is normal, but that is wrong. So every man that's married in this room, let me tell you, I don't care how much, how godly you are. I don't care how many times you lay hands on people and miraculous things happen. I don't give you five cents worth of the power of God that flows through your life. If when the door shuts, you don't treat your wife with the fruit of the spirit. See, a bunch of you guys, you hear me talk about my husband who's the senior pastor of the church, who is the hero of my life. I've never known a man more godly than Sam Mayo. And he is the old song years ago, when beneath my wings. Has anyone ever told you you're my hero? You're everything I would like to be. I can fly higher than an eagle. You are the wind beneath my wings. And that's really who he is. Never known a more godly man. And see, a bunch of you guys would go, boy, I wish my wife would stand around and sing wind beneath my wings to me. <laughs> she just sings turkey songs, you know, you know, instead of eagle. But you know what? That's because you act like a turkey to her. See, if you want your wife to treat you like a hero, you better treat her like a queen when the door's shut. 
And now this is all for the married couples and the rest of you, this is just free. And this is just free and all of you who are single, you just don't even listen this moment. And those of you that are junior high, if you're gonna get offended, plug your ears. But you hear these words all the time out there in the real world. To all of you married gentlemen, let me explain to you. If the only time you're nice to her is when you wanna have some romantic time with her, hello. She will think that you are a user and an animal who's in heat. That was free. So the fruit of the Spirit, you know, gentlemen, again, I'm talking only to the married guys and some of you guys that someday you want to be. Remember this motherly word of counsel. With the fruit of the Spirit, start the fire burning in the furnace in the morning with your kindness before you leave home. And by the end of the evening, it will be blazing hot. Thank you. All right. Some of you got that. Richard understood. All right. But see, far too often in the ministry to our immediate families, we're great in church, but we're poor in pub private. And so please understand for all of us, whether it's husband, wife, or mom, dad, or brother, sister, and I know brothers and sisters can be, and we won't take a survey here, but how many of you have ever known a brother or sister that kind of tested patience? Probably wasn't yours. Probably wasn't yours, but you knew a brother or sister kind of tested the limits, okay? We, we understand that, you know? In the Mayo house, my two sons are both amazing and they are both light years different from each other. And I just kind of sit back and, and, and just smiling, like kind of watch sometimes and shake my head. But again, the problem stage, you gotta be a lamp without blemish. And if you will learn, you don't have to be perfect, but if you will just learn to say, I blew it, I'm sorry. Everybody, let's practice those lines because people don't seem to be real good at that. I blew it. I'm sorry. Now, let me tell you how you don't do this, okay? All right, let me, let, we're going to do, we're going to do like a survey from the front. Who's, I can't even see who's down there. Colin, come here, honey. Come help me. Come on, Colin. It's one of my interns. Come on, babe. Okay, quick, honey. Hurry. All right, now, Colin. You just had, like, you blew it in front of, like, your brothers. He has amazing brothers or sister or your folks. Use the voice tone where you're saying you're sorry, but use it, the bad one. Like, like you're saying it, but, but it's not saying it. Try that, the bad voice tone. I'll apologize All right. I'm sorry, but you blump. That's right. Blump. That's right. Keep going. I, I'm so good. Do it again. Okay, all right. Because what? He hit him? No, he didn't hit him. Okay, all right. All right. Neil, I am sorry that I got real angry and I said some things that I probably shouldn't say, but maybe you shouldn't borrow my shirt next time without asking. And then trying to put it back in my drawer without washing it. All right. Is that good? All right. So good. Everybody clap for Colin, my intern. He's amazing. The man. And, and see, understand that over and over again, we say, I'm sorry, but, or we say it with voice tone that has attitudes. And then don't expect the other person to think you're amazing and full of Jesus at that moment. You, you learn to say, I'm real sorry. You know, I blew it. I had to learn to apologize for wrong attitudes, wrong voice tones. The test of your spirituality is not how much you use your prayer language. I think a far more valid test is how you use your mouth to quickly accept blame. Do you hear that? Now, I, like Paul in the book of Corinthians, speak in tongues more than you all. So I am, am beyond a proponent of a prayer language. But how sad, because the book of James says that the same mouth that says has sweetness also has bitterness out of it. So your parents, what are you going to do? Walk up to your parents and go, <laughs> Now some of you say, did she just fake that? No. When that language is used enough, that is there. So I wasn't doing that to be funny. When that, when that language is used enough, that language is there for you because the Bible says the spirit is subject to the prophet. So I wasn't meaning that to be funny, although I can understand why you laughed. So you're not bad that you laughed, but I, I would never do it to be funny. But the issue is, you know what? It's just about that preposterous to our family members when maybe we don't use our prayer language, but we use all of our religious 
and garbage and jargon and all that stuff. And then we do something wrong and we don't fully own it. Or, you know what, if you want to be real spiritual, why don't you try imitating Jesus, who on the cross took a rap for sin that he had nothing to do with. So if you really want to be a lamb for a house, why don't you own and apologize for things that are really not mostly your fault? Now, I don't mean you walk around your house going, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm a loser, loser, loser. I'm just saying, you know, some of you, you might try it and help you, but you, I mean, you, you go, well, it wasn't mostly my fault. Well, so what if it mostly wasn't your fault? Jesus died on the cross and took a rap that was not at all his fault for us. You can clap for that. So you want to be a lamb for the house, own some things, own some I'm sorry's when you don't really have to. They only, you go, well, I'm not going to tell them I'm sorry because they know it's their fault. Well, you know what? They probably already know that, sweetheart. You know? What do you want, Jesus, the next time you repent for something? You want him to lean over him and go, wasn't my fault. <laughs> no. And so, in the lamb for a household, lamb without blemish, an eye surgeon, and this is such a great picture of how you win people to the Lord. An eye surgeon went into China as a missionary, and he went to Chinese hospitals. And he, his first surgery over there as a missionary was done on a Chinese man who was blind due to cataracts because it was in a very primitive area, and uh, they didn't have the medical technology. And so he removed the cataracts. And it was, and I've got to get my story straight, about two and a half weeks later, that the missionary was so surprised because standing outside the missionary compound in China was, was a line of 48 blind men who had come for the cataract surgery. And they had walked for 250 miles in very primitive places in China to make it back to the missionary compound. And when the missionary doctor opened the door, he saw, you know how the blind, all the guys made it? They had a long rope, and they had walked all that way, all hanging on to the rope to get to where they could meet the physician who could make them able to see again. Who were they led by? Oh, you know who they were led by. They were led by the one man who had been the first man whose cataracts had been removed, who had gone back to say, like Bible, I was once blind, but now I see. Get on this rope, and I'll lead you. I'll lead you by my life to the physician. And you know what, folks? You want to lead your family and your friends to the Lord? Then you better live a life and walk or walk a walk straight enough that, baby, you're not taking side trips to parties and the local whatevers. You better walk them straight to the physician, and that's worth clapping over. Get on the rope and walk them to the physician. And then last point. Not only was the provision given in Exodus 12, a lamb for a house, and then the problem, but the lamb has to be without blemish. And again, I want to keep saying, you're going to have flesh flashes. You're going to mess up. Just learn to apologize quickly. You don't have to be perfect. Nobody's perfect. And the last point is the privilege. The provision, the promise, and now the privilege. It's in Exodus 12, verse 7. And I read it to you before. It says, and they shall take the blood from the lamb and put it on the doorposts of the houses where in they live. They shall take the blood from the lamb, Exodus 12, 7, and put it on the doorposts of not just everybody's houses, but after you shed the, the little sacrificial lamb, you were to take that, and a family member, the head of the house, was to significantly and symbolically apply that to the doorpost of their family. And that was the privilege. And then you, you go on and you hear, and, and then the word of God said, you know, when I see the blood, I'm going to pass over that house. Folks, there's got to be somebody in the word of God that even today, and, and I know a bunch of you are already doing this, but I want to call a bunch of you to the privilege of being the person who, like Ezekiel talks about, who stands in the gap for your family who stands in the gap. Now, I know it's a morning session, so nobody gets real hoop and holler in the morning, but read. And I'm just talking conversationally to you today because it's the mom heart that wants you to hear. You know, you're preaching and shouting and yelling. That's probably not going to change their life. But I'll tell you what, if you will live it in front of them, just live the fruit of the Spirit, shut your mouth up and serve them, 
and just, you know what, figure out what your unsafe parents, figure out what matters to them. Like if it's being responsible, if it's like being home at a certain time, you better figure out what matters to them and you'd better jump through that hoop as long as it's not biblical. Not biblical. And, and so somebody's got to be a person who like, like Ezekiel says, says God seeks all over the earth for a man or woman to stand in the spiritual gap prayer wise and to hold back the flood tide of the enemy's work in people's lives through prayer through intercession for that family member, but he couldn't find one. And so I quickly learned that it was better for me. Yes, I said a few words at right times after I'd lived it enough in front of them that I had the right to say words. And I'm going to read to you a letter which is kind of uh, similar to one that I wrote to uh, my folks. And I'm just going to read it to you. And some of you may want to buy the tape, and I know this sounds silly, and transcribe part of the letter off because some of you just don't know how to get words out your mouth. And so that's not childish. I would have given anything if somebody would have done this for me. So buy the tape and transcribe the letter and change some of the words into your own, uh, your own handwriting. But don't give them a letter like this or say something to them like this until you have lived the fruit of the Spirit in front of them for a period of time. Do you hear that? Don't, don't, don't do this till your life has been different. Show them that your life is different. I even say to my amazing interns when they start, you know, if we do this thing right, you come out more like Jesus, even with your family. Because if the altar is not altering how you live at home, the altar is not doing what God means for it to do. And so it is your privilege to be the stand in the gap person for people that you love and care about, especially your family members, and certainly for unsafe friends. But again, I want to caution you. Back way away, you can't hang out all the time with you. You can't spend the time because it's the chair analogy. You will be back down, you know? And again, you can still, I'm not saying you don't hang out with any unsafe friends. I'm just saying you guard the amounts of time. You guard the emotional energy because the Word of God says clearly light just doesn't have fellowship with darkness. You are one of two things in every unsafe relationship. You're either a missionary or a mission field. And a bunch of my gang tried to say, I'm being a missionary to get my unsafe friends one to the Lord. That's bogus. That's bogus. Because you know what? You're never going to win them to the Lord by going to all the same parties and all the same places. Not going to happen. You go, well, they're saying I've gotten too spiritual for them and I've just thrown them off. Again, that line is as old as Satan. There's a, I've heard that all life. Just listen. If you don't hear me say anything else, it doesn't work that other way. It just doesn't. And so you better, and some of you, if you value your walk with God, if you really don't want your friends to split hell wide open, you better back out of that relationship and pray for them. Get yourself strong enough so a year or so later, you're able to, to nuance back in and make statements. That's how I was able to lead my best friend to the Lord. Her name was Jane. And we didn't do terrible things with each other, but we certainly were not godly influences on each other. And so when I came to faith in Christ, you know, I just, I didn't just throw her away, but she knew things had changed. And it was real awkward for a period of time because when I got back with her, I found myself drifting attitude and action wise towards the old me. And so I had to back away and it was hard. It was not easy. So I just want to say to every one of you here and youth leaders, youth pastors, we got to be careful on this one because we do one of two things. We either preach light has no fellowship with darkness so hard that our kids rebel against it or then we're, we're afraid to challenge them at all and neither balance is right it is it is tough gang I'm gonna say this to you I'm looking at people like Jacob and Bryce who've recently come to faith in Christ listen let me explain to you it is hard to back away from a bunch of old friends I look at people like Scott Zabel who was raised with the same amazing friends since almost kindergarten and when he came to faith in Christ had to make some very costly moves to back away because he knew that he would, he would find himself moving back in that same direction. You go, I'm strong enough to handle it. That is as stupid as going to the top of this roof and jumping off and saying, I'm strong enough to defy the law of gravity. You will not defy any of God's laws. You are not bigger than God's laws. God's law says light has no fellowship with darkness. And see, the joy, let me tell you, Scott, come here just for a minute. None of them knew I was going to do this, and I didn't either. Come real fast. Scott went to Hananiga High School. And so this is a quick plug. A wonderful public high school, knew his friends for years, came to faith in Christ, backed away from those people, and it was hard. Oh, was it hard. 
Okay, now let me tell you the end of the picture storybook, which certainly the Lord had in his plans, but Scott had no way of knowing that. We have now come full circle, and Scott is beginning effective this week an internship with me, and tell them where you're going back to run a cell group to make hell nervous. <clears throat> going back to Hanega High School, yes. um, where I had to leave because I knew I'd fall back. And I left and I went to a different school for a while um, where I knew nobody and I thought nothing would ever turn around. But uh, Jeannie gave me the honor to, uh, to intern for her and now I get to go back into Hanega High School and uh, now I get to go back to my old friends too. So. So as we end today, I'm going to tell you that when you do it God's way, there are all sorts of smiles and privileges that come with it. And somebody, worship team, come on back up, if you will. I was the person who said, Lord, again, that scripture, when I see the blood, the word of God says, I'm going to pass over you. And I remember saying over and over and just start playing whatever. I was, remember saying over and over to the Lord, Lord, please, I, wanna, I want to stand in the privilege in prayer of standing in the gap prayer-wise. That's just praying for your folks and your family. I don't want to violate scriptural commandments. I want to stand in the gap. I want to be a lamb for a house, and I want to do it in a way that makes you smile. And the end of my story is that beautifully, and it took lots of years, but I was able to lead both my dad and my mom to Jesus Christ. Um, and while we were still in Nebraska, my dad passed away first. And then you heard me read the little poem about when my mom died. And my mom had often said, and this is, I, boy, I don't usually tell this. My mom had often said, Jeannie, I, when I became a youth leader, teach those teenagers to love their families the way you love me and daddy. And so as my closing tribute to my mom, when she died of lung cancer real suddenly, because like I said, she had smoked her whole life. You think I don't like smoking? I don't like smoking for lots of reasons. One is my dad died of emphysema from smoking and my mom died of lung cancer. And they all stop later in life, but they stop too late. And so, you know, that night my mom had died. Her funeral was on Thursday morning. Our youth service was Wednesday night in Nebraska. And so I said to the funeral director, I want mama, when she was gonna have the funeral at the church, I want mama at, at my youth gathering. And so that evening, uh, not in a grandstand kind of way, cause she was the most precious friend I could have ever had. Yet to this day, really miss her cause she was such a great listener. And as she got old, she got senile. And, and she would, I'd say, now, Mama, don't tell this to anybody. And she, but she always had a sense of humor, and she'd laugh, and she'd say, Jeannie, you don't have to worry about that because you know I'm going to forget what you said five minutes after you tell me. And she was right. She was. But, you know, I, I, she just, boy, I can't tell you how much I miss her as a listener who always cared. But that night we rolled her casket in, and I had her in my youth service right down front. I was speaking here, and the casket was up front here. And I said, Gay, my mom told me to help you someday love your families the way I had tried to love them to faith. And I've tried to teach you to do that. And, and so tonight, before I have her funeral, her final commencement service tomorrow morning in this church, I'm going to make one more run at that. And so that evening, you know, um, kind of a, a night like this morning saying, okay, be a lamb for a house, for your house, for your brothers, your sisters, your mom, your dad. I end with this. It was 1989, and there was an earthquake that hit Armenia, and over 30,000 people were killed in a matter of minutes. And after the quake, a father left the safety of his house and rushed to the school where he knew his son was at the time of the earthquake. And when he arrived, he found that the building had also been leveled. And you can imagine the huge devastation. He had once made a promise to his son, and he had said to his son, no matter what, dad will always be there for you. So as he looked at the pile of debris in a way that any parent would, he felt hopeless and obviously overwhelmed with grief at the scene of the earthquake, realizing his son was buried some underneath tons of concrete and bricks. 
what could he possibly do? But he kept remembering his commitment that he made his, to, to his son, Dad. Well, no matter what, I'll, Dad will always be there for you. And so he went back to where he knew his son's classroom was. It was the back right corner, and he began to take stone after stone and part of concrete off a part of concrete. And people came around him and all began to say it's hopeless. But he didn't listen, and he said, won't you please help me? But of course, they just cried and walked away because they, they love their kids, but they recognized it to be hopeless. And the fire officials came and said, sir, please stop because there are still fires that are, that are breaking out all over from the earthquake damage at any point. It could be your life. Stop. It's, it's hopeless. And he would look at the fire guys and say, won't you please help me? And eight hours went to 12, and 12 went to 16, and 16 went to 32. And it was a total of 40 hours that this true story was supposedly the Armenian father kept working at the back corner where he knew his son's classroom 40 hours, never went home, never rested, never stopped, driven by the commitment that he said his, his son, um, that'll, that'll always come through for you. And so perhaps you've heard the story really happened. And it was during the 40th hour that the Armenian father heard a voice and he recognized it like all true parents know the voice. Because when you're a parent, you know yours. And let me just tell you, when you're a spiritual parent, you know yours. Bunch of you that are single and you don't have kids yet, listen to me. This whole society is desperate to have somebody spiritually parent them. Do you hear me? So let's have at it. And I want to challenge some of you that are married. Yes, your own biological children are obviously your family is your priority. We've tried to model, Pastor Mayo and I, that we could, we could keep our kids. Our kids love Jesus. We don't deserve either one of our sons that are both now college age. But the reality is both of them love the Lord, but yet we still had a ministry through it all. And so that dad heard his son's voice. And, and so, you know, he knew that he had finally found him. And so he obviously answers. He said, Armand, Armand. And, and, and his son whispered again. He was weak. And, and, and so, you know, he, the dad became overwhelmed with joy and, and began to pull more. And he found his son was on earth. And as the Lord's providence would have it, the earthquake had made the concrete come in almost like a, a tent of a triangle underneath, far underneath the earth. And so there were 13 young kids that were trapped in that little triangle with them. And the little boy said words that I want to haunt you when you pray for your family and your friends and you think nothing's ever gonna happen. He looked at his dad and his dad said, Armand, come out. He said, no dad, there are other kids with me. Get them first. And then he said these words. I told them they didn't have to worry because I knew you'd come for me. Who looks hopeless in your life? How significant is your prayer life, your faith, and your living in front of them? And can they say at some point, you know what, I, I knew you'd come for me. I knew you wouldn't give up praying. I knew you wouldn't give up living in front of me and asking forgiveness and washing the dishes and cleaning your room and, and stuff. And I'm gonna, I, I was going to skip the letter, but I feel prompted the Lord to read it. Why don't you stand with, you know? And I'm going to do this. I'm going to dismiss because you have lunch right now in five minutes. I'm going to dismiss right fast all the youth leaders, and then you can come back in here and get your kids right after us because you have two lunch shifts, and you know your shifts. I'm going to dismiss all the youth leaders real fast to go out this door and to the right to the chapel that are interested that you got the source things so you can pick up your freebie. Choose your freebie, and any of my gang that are helping with that, run over there real fast. So just youth leaders, dismiss yourself so you can come back and get your kids in here. You got an extra five minutes, go out that door so I can give you my free thing if you got the source. And then to the right is the chapel. Let me read to the rest of you the letter that I wrote. And some of you can just get the tape and you can transcribe it and make it sound like yours. Dear, for me it was dear, dear mom and dad, 
And I wrote a letter similar to this to my best friend Jane also, obviously changing the words. And I, I want to stress again, the letter didn't come till I'd live for Christ in front of them and had the fruit of the Spirit for a period of time. I'm not even sure how to begin this letter, Mom and Dad. I, I just know that I, it's probably one of the most important things I'll ever attempt to communicate with you on. I'm sure you realize that Jesus Christ has become real important in my life. But maybe what you, d you don't realize is that both of you are really important in my life too. I'm really sorry, Mom and Dad. I, I do a pretty rotten job of showing it lots of times, but I really do love you both. I guess I need to also say that I'm really sorry the way I, probably I've made Christianity look pretty bad sometimes by my, and then you do have to fill in whatever yours is, my anger, my lack of sensitivity, my self-centeredness, my attitudes, my coming home late, my lack of respect, my undiscipline, whatever. All I need you to know, though, is that heaven won't be heaven if you're not there for me. Without trying to sound pushy or super spiritual, just know that I think, honestly, that you're two of the greatest parents in the world, and I really am praying for you. Please don't make this whole business about giving your life to Jesus Christ too difficult. It's a choice just to ask him into your life and to forgive from all the garbage that we've all done and to make him number one. It's not a certain religion or a certain church or a certain denomination. It's just Jesus being our best friend and number one. And from that decision begins to emerge the most incredible friendship with, with the God of the universe that I've ever experienced. You, and this is, this is especially the lines I used with my friend Jane, you, Janie, have helped me define the word friendship in my life because you've really been a great friend to me. So just know that though I, I struggle to have the courage to say what I want to you sometimes, Jane, and say you similar words with my folks, all of this, you really do matter so much to me. If you ever want to talk about all of this or would like to come to church with me sometime, I can't tell you how honored I'd be. But most importantly, just know that Jesus and I both really do love and care for you. He's made a huge difference in my life. And I would love for you to consider allowing him to make one in yours, lovingly, whatever. I don't know who your person is today, but as we in all over, and I would call you forward, but there, it's lunch break right now, and there are gonna be way too many of you to come forward. I wanna see the hands of people who say, there's somebody, and it may be a family friend, or it may be a friend, that maybe you've even vacillated lines on, and you know you need to do it way differently but you have a beloved unbeliever that you want to be the lamb for the house for. Hands up, will you? you have a beloved unbeliever. We're not gonna, it's lunch break and I'm very aware of that, so we're not gonna ask you to come forward. But I want you, if you will, right now, uh, you know, our wonderful worship leader is just gonna lead whatever she feels the Lord kind of prompting. And, and will you just for a moment uh, would you kind of be friends to each other on the mountain of God? Kind of grab somebody's hand next to you. You don't have to go across the aisle. And kind of just for a minute, she's going to sing, but will you just for a minute cry out to God and ask him to make you a lamb for a house? Will you? Come on. I don't want to have to work on this. Come on. Let's pray while she sings. Father, in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Turn the other cheek and yeah, sorry yeah. with the life. Let us share your fellowship, oh, even of your sufferings. Never let the passion die. Help us live the life. Help us live the life. Help us live the life, Jesus. And all we want to do is bring you something real. Bring you something true. Help us live the life. Sing that. 
Help us live the life. Help us live the life. Help us live the life, Jesus. Help us live the life. All we want to do. All we want to do. Is bring you something real. Bring you something true. All right, just for a minute. Before we close in prayer, I want I want to hear you just for a minute. I don't want now I want a little bit of standing in the gap praying for about 60 seconds short prayers to reach the throne room when you don't live too far away i want you to militantly ask god to make you a person who in prayer and by your life stands in the gap come on let's pray father in jesus name in jesus name god make men and women in this wonderful sanctuary lambs for their house lambs for their house bring exodus 12 to life god all over this sanctuary today bring exodus 12 to life we take the promise we recognize the problem we by faith bring the privilege to bear may we be a lamb for a house may the blood of jesus through our faith as we pray and our life as we live stand in the gap for unsafe family members in Jesus' name, oh God, give us the courage not to compromise or rationalize with unsafe friends. We want to do this right, Jesus, so people will be in heaven and not in hell. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. I'd love to pray longer, but I want to be sensitive to the lunch schedule. Scott doesn't even know. Scott, come on back up. I want you to close in prayer, and I want you to pray for unsafe family members. And the reason I walked Scott back up here, and this would be okay to say, is there's one of his parents who he loves desperately. And, and the parent's okay that he's interning, but he's just not altogether sure um, how things are with his parent. And the Lord may be saved, maybe not saved. Who knows? For one of his parents. And so he would understand how to pray for family members and friends who are not Christians. So you know what, you can drop hands, but let's not drop hearts. Let's God pray. Lord, we come to you right now, Father God in Brownsville, Lord Jesus, and we just lift up our family members to you right now, Lord God. God, be saved or not saved, Father God, I pray, Lord, that you would give us strength, Father God, to just walk out this thing, Father God, like we know we need to do, Father God, that you give us courage, Lord Jesus, to walk out what we need to walk out, God, to be quick to apologize, Father God. And God, I just pray, Lord, that we would walk this thing out, not so much talking, Father God, but we would walk it out and live it out, Father God, apologizing, Father God, and serving them, Father God, and being Christ-like to them, Lord Jesus. God, I pray that we would continue in prayer for them, Father God, because that's so important, Lord Jesus. And I just pray that, that, Lord, we'd stand in the gap for them, Father God, and whatever they're going through, Father God, we'd be there for them to pick them up, Lord Jesus. And I pray, Lord, that we know it's going to be hard, Lord, but it says in your word that we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us, Lord. And I just pray that you'd move, Father God, and you'd, you'd take a new passion from this place in us, Father God, to go back into our families, Lord Jesus, with passion and with motivation, Father God, to do this thing all the way, Father God. Lord, we love you, and thank you for what you're going to do ahead of time, Lord. Amen. All right, now Sarah's coming. One more time, give the Lord a huge round of applause, will you? Father, we honor you. Thank you that we can be a lamb for a house. A lamb for your house and our house. A lamb for a house. We honor you. Thanks for such a privilege. In Jesus' name. Okay, now adorable Sarah is coming, so don't leave. Just before you sit down, though, turn around to somebody and say, lunch is going to be great. But it's not Taco Bell today. Taco Bell is the last day, so the gas will be the last day. You are such a sweetheart. You are wonderful. Hey, guys. Can I get everyone to sit down, please? Just everyone take a real quick seat. How many of you guys just appreciated Jeannie's ministry and how awesome she is? 